since you work at a level four, what is the difference between all the different levels of NICU? That's a great question. I remember um, this was years ago. This family of twins came us to us from an outlier hospital because one of the twins got really, really sick and needed surgery. And when they were pregnant and they ha were having twins, they were like, well, the hospital had a NICU. So we, we thought we were okay just being at that hospital. Um, this was a particular hospital that didn't use donor milk. They just, if the mother ran out of milk, they used formula and this baby got a case of necrotizing enterocolitis. We call it NEC in the NICU, NEC. It's very catastrophic to babies. A lot of babies will die from it or they'll lose quite a bit of their intestines or all of their intestines. And um, so one of the twins got NEC and came to us and the dad was like, you know, we thought we were okay at that NICU. And had their baby not get, gotten sick, they probably would have been fine. He goes, but we would have never given the baby formula had we known. So yes, there is different levels of NICUs. You have a basic nursery, which would be like a level one, which is just any hospital that just has a nursery. And every Cal hospital in California has to have a nursery. They don't really use them anymore because the baby friendly initiative, most babies are room. Those healthy babies, any healthy babies is usually just staying with their mother, okay? Even though there's a, a nursery in the hospital. And then you have your level two NICUs or just basic feedings, healthy kids just need to get bigger kind of a thing. And then you have level three NICUs, which can take vented babies. They'll do higher settings on vents, intubated babies, maybe some pressors for blood pressure issues or whatever. And then you have your level four NICUs, which is what I work in, which handle everything. So if you have cardiac defects, if you have brain injuries, if you have kids born um, with surgical problems such as gut issues, um, atresias, some genetic issues like bone issues, like osteogenesis imperfecta, um, uh, soft bone disease. Um, and then we get the kids that are transferred in for genetic anomaly, anomalies, different types of syndrome, charge syndrome, uh, Piero, I mean, there's so many genetic components to some kids. And a lot of times you don't know that they're gonna have a problem until they're born. Like you don't even know. And then the babies are born and they don't look right and they get sent to us as well. So that's the basic differences, excuse me, in different level NICUs. So, and a lot of your level threes are they're smaller. They're, excuse me, drinking a diet soda. Um, they, um, they're smaller, they don't have as many beds. You know, you can have a NICU with just a couple beds. Um, some NICUs can have, level three NICUs can have, you know, up to 20 beds or whatever. We are licensed for 84 beds and we are constantly full, constantly full. In fact, right now there's no room at the end. <laughs> so we're, we'll hold babies in L and D until we have discharges so that we can bring those babies that need us that were delivered, we'll hold them up and then bring them in once those babies are discharged. We have no room in the end right now. And we're actually shipping babies back to outlying hospitals as much as we can right now because we're short staffed and we just don't have enough space. How many outlying hospitals do you have around you? A lot. So we're in the Inland Empire. Our boundaries go as far north as Bishop Mammoth, um, the desert between Las Vegas and us. We go all the way out to the Arizona border and then down to San Diego County. Oh, wow. That and then huge. west to about LA County because LA has its own children's hospitals. So yeah, pretty big, pretty big area because San Bernardino, we cover San Bernardino and Riverside counties. So San Bernardino County is the largest county in all of the United States as far as miles are concerned. So really big wide area. Yeah. No, I know the area that's really big. <laughs> that's really big. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's makes sense of why 84 is not enough beds for that's no. a lot of mm -hmm. a lot of area. Yeah. Since you've explained like the levels of NICUs, what's an ideal level NICU that someone would want to have for their delivery of their baby? That's a great question. If you're normal, pregnant, nothing's come up in your pregnancy, you have a completely normal anatomy scan. It's a singleton pregnancy, not a multiple. A level two is probably just fine, right? And you're healthy. 
Um, a lot of the babies that come into the NICU, unfortunately, are the moms aren't healthy. So if the mom's not healthy, a lot of times they're delivering a sick baby. Um, so if you're healthy, you don't have any gestational diabetes, any cardiac disease, any blood pressure issues, you have a singleton, your anatomy scans completely normal, you have a normal pregnancy, a level two is, is fine. Um, let's say you have a multiple pregnancy, uh, maybe you have some diabetes, but it's well controlled uh, with diet, you're monitoring your blood sugars, even if you're on some insulin, um, things like that, but your anatomy scan is still normal, or maybe you might have a large for gestational age baby and you're planning a C-section, okay? And that is a reason to plan a C-section is diabetes, okay? Um, you can probably go to a level three, for sure, not a problem. They can handle, multi, uh, you know, twin deliveries. You're getting into higher gestational numbers, triplets and beyond. Uh, if you have an abnormal anatomy scan, you have a cardiac defect, something going on with the kidneys, definitely something going on with the head. Um, anything outside of that, you probably want to look for a higher level of a NICU to take that on. And more than likely, if you see those things in your pregnancy, hopefully they're referring you to a maternal fetal medicine specialist who's affiliated with a higher level NICU. And you guys can make those decisions together. Like that goes beyond just normal obstetrics when you start getting into those diagnoses, especially like uncontrolled diabetes, or if you're a mother with a cardiac condition, um, you should be receiving care above and beyond a regular obstetrician anyway. Um, and then you guys can make that decision as to where to be followed through. And then if you get something coming up in your pregnancy, let's say you're admitted into antepartum because you're sick or um, you've uh, started dilating and you have a cerclage and, you know, or your water has a slow leak or whatever, um, your NICU should be coming in and consulting to you anyway. And, and, and so that, that the doctors are, you know, we're aware of you coming before you get there and we consult with you and talk to you about what's going to happen and, and things like that. What about TOLAC and VBAC? Like TOLAC VBACs? <sighs> Well, first it's gonna determine on hospital policy, right? So when I had my baby after Alexa, when I had Abby, that hospital I was at does not do any type of VBACs. Their policy does not allow for a VBAC. Um, my hospital where I work does allow for VBACs. So I think that if you're going for a VBAC, um, if the hospital policies allow it, you probably should double check to make sure what kind of level that NICU is, right? So um, probably at least a three, uh, ideally a four, um, you know, cause those kids, you know, if you have a uterine abruption and that baby loses volume and you have a hypoxic injury, you want access to cooling, right? So uh, granted we can bring kids in for cooling from those hospitals that um, don't do it. You have up to six hours, a six hour window. Uh, but you also want a hospital that's equipped to handle that crash situation as well. So those are all things that you need to discuss with your physician beforehand in planning, in planning that birth.